well, things have been breaking and things are going to continue to break. And the, the real solution at the end of the day, when things get worse, and they will, because there's too much stress in the credit markets, like every cornered nation, uh, Powell and other central banks will be forced to destroy their currencies. It's always the last bubble to break. It's always the currency. On today's episode of the What the Finance podcast, I'm happy to welcome back Matthew Piefenberg, uh, who's from Matterhorn Asset Management. So Matthew, thanks for joining the podcast today. Great to be back. Lots to talk about. Yeah, definitely. And we're just saying that since we last talked, so much has happened. So, you know, we've, we mentioned there's been a banking crisis. Uh, there's been lots of other things. So I guess from your perspective, what are you currently seeing? What are the main things you're focusing on? Uh, and do you think it could get worse or sort of is the worst behind us? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, as we were saying before this, I mean, it's an evolution of a lot of the themes that you and I and many others have been talking about throughout 2022. And now they're, you know, they're coming home to roost, but there's still far more to come. I mean, again, we we can talk about it at the 30,000 foot level, get into the the, the ground level. But, you know, the, the, the key word is always debt and the bond market is the thing, as I've said over and over for years, but in particular the last two years um, and this year specifically, you know, you've seen, and I've said this many times, you've seen major implosions in dislocations in credit markets because of central bank policy. And there's just no doubt that they're highly correlated. And raising rates into a bond bubble is going to lead to something breaking. Well, something broke already in Silvergate or, you know, Silvergate and Silicon Valley Bank and Signature and First Republic. And of course, Credit Suisse was already dying long before those. They're, they're different, but they're similar. But these bond market crises, which we saw in 2019 in the repo markets where the big banks didn't trust each other's collateral. And then in 2020 with the COVID crisis and the sovereign bonds were tanking faster as, as fast as, bond, as stocks. And then the guilt implosion in the UK in October of last year, and then coming into March of this year, um, we already had you know major bank, private regional banks, or excuse me, regional banks in the U.S. failing, and then Credit Suisse having to be bailed out too big to fail, reminiscent of 2008. So these are all major indications of a broken bond market. To me, the banking crisis in, say, Silicon Valley was a symptom not of a banking crisis, but of a bond crisis, because as the Fed was raising rates, the underlying value of their of the treasuries, which were on the balance sheets of these banks, lost a lot of value in a matter of a short period of time because rates were risen too fast and too high. Typically, banks like rising rates because they can arbitrage rates to their advantage and make better profits, but not when that happens that fast because it basically cut the, the rug out from pulled the rug out from under them. It killed their collateral. With, with Credit Suisse, it was the sins of the past. It was the investment banking arm. It was leverage. It was derivatives. It's counterparty risk. It's bad management. That's reminiscent of more of a 2008 type of typical bad bank and a typical bailout by the Swiss National Bank and another bank like UBS, like JP Morgan bought bear at pennies on the dollar. So Credit Suisse is more reminiscent of 2008. Silvergate, Silicon Valley Bank, these other regional banks are more typical of the Powell rate hikes. So they're all connected, but they all come back to a distorted bond market. And the bond market is distorted because of central banks in general and certainly you know, Jay Powell in particular. So again, all these themes in, you know, central bank policy, quantitative tightening, quantitative easing, pivoting, et cetera, they're all, they're all connected. And they're all really proving that Powell in particular and central banks in general are totally stuck. They're stuck. As we said last time, if Powell keeps raising rates, something's going to break. Well, he broke regional banks. And if he, if he pauses and then pivots, then we have an inflationary problem. So what's he going to do? Did he really fight inflation by cutting the Fed balance sheet last year with all that talk for quantitative tightening, all these brutal rate hikes, 25 bips here, 50 bips there. What's he going to do next? But the, when you look back and you step back, all he did was reduce the Fed balance sheet by 300 billion, which is a dent. It's a hiccup. And that 300 billion has already been lost in bailing out the regional banks. So nothing was gained. We're running uphill in roller skates. Uh, inflation really wasn't defeated. In my opinion, it was never really the aim, but that's another conversation. But we're right back to where we started, a cornered central bank uh, stuck between two terrible options, pivot, have hyperinflation, keep raising rates, destroy the bond and equity markets. Remember, in the U.S. last year, nominal returns, stocks and bonds, the worst joint return in the equity and credit market since 1871. So things are breaking everywhere. Um, and again, this isn't sensationalism anymore. This isn't negative bear talk. This isn't 
uh, apologizing for the gold argument. It's just bad math everywhere. And, you know, things have been breaking and things are going to continue to break. And the, the real solution at the end of the day, when things get worse, and they will, because there's too much stress in the credit markets, like every cornered nation, uh, Powell and other central banks will be forced to destroy their currencies. It's always the last bubble to break. It's always the currency. At some point, um, there's going to have to be printed money to buy unwanted IOUs, whether that's in Canada, Australia, America, or Europe. No one else is buying them. No one else will support them. So central banks will have to monetize them, and that is inherently inflationary. And that also, and then the de-dollarization phenomena that's happening. It's not the end of the dollars, world reserve currency. We can talk about that. That too is related to rising rates. Fed is raising rates. 40% of the world's debt is based in US dollars. So when you raise the rates and you raise the cost of that debt, countries like the BRIC countries are going to look for alternative settlements, alternative arrangements, alternative trade agreements. That's related to the Powell you know, rate hike. And then, of course, you've got Saudi Arabia talking to other countries. You've got Iran talking to Saudi Arabia. You've got China talking to Saudi Arabia. You've got India and, and China and Russia. All these countries are looking for ways to get away from the U.S. dollar, even with petrol, which was once the sacred cow of the U.S. government, the petrodollar. So the petrodollar, de-dollarization, broken bond market, threatened equity markets, failing banks. This isn't me making these headlines up. They are happening in real time. And in the meantime, you've got, you know, you've got Bakhmut right now in the Ukraine, which is like the final straw. It's the final battle in, in Russia and in Ukraine. So there's so much happening right now. It's hard to keep up. There's there's any number of those headlines we could spend an hour on. So, you know, it's crazy. These are crazy times. But this is what happens when countries are broke. Things start to fracture. New alliances are made. More central, more centralization, central bank digital currency. Not a coincidence. That's another topic coming out. So, Anthony, I mean, there's just so much happening, obviously, all related, but all fingers point back to the fingerprints of central banks gone wild since, you know, certainly since 2008, but really even earlier than that with Greenspan, in my opinion, was the patient zero. Um, they're like Westmoreland in Vietnam. We're losing the war, but he'll always tell you you're winning. Central banks have to really, they have to use calm words to hide bad math, but there's so many things breaking at once now. They look almost silly trying to come up with a way to spin this in a positive way long answer to your question Andy, but <laughs> start there we can go from anyone any of those themes <laughs> yeah no, that's right there's, as you said there's so much to talk about so if, if we look yeah. at i guess qe and what the central banks have been doing and i know we talked about this a little bit last time so f from my perspective i see it almost as like you know maybe a stimulant that they're injecting to the economy it could be caffeine could be anything that you want but what's happened mm -hmm. is the more they've done it, the less effective it's become. There's got that diminishing returns, I guess you could say, sort of like yep. like a stimulant. So do you think they've, do they still have any control whatsoever over, I guess, what's happening in the markets? Or do you think they've lost control completely? What's your thoughts on that? It's an interesting point. You, you use the word caffeine. That's that's being generous. And, and I'm not trying to be, you know, difficult, but it's really, it's a hard word. It's more like cocaine or hard alcohol or whiskey. Because caffeine can get you jolted, but it doesn't really kill you. Uh, too much alcohol, too much cocaine, too much toxic materials, toxic uppers result in a really bad hangover, liver damage, or f fatal death. And so QE for a while could have been just caffeine, QE1, which is what Bernanke promised. But when it became QE2, QE3, QE4, Operation Twist, then unlimited QE post-COVID, that caffeine became something far more toxic. So even if we're being generous, let's just say it's whiskey. But if you have too much whiskey, it's a lot of fun for a few hours, but the hangover is brutal. And so unlike caffeine, the whiskey that has been used for QE uh, has, is creating hangovers, it's creating illness, it's creating vomiting in certain sectors, literally. And to your point, well, technically, yes, technically, MMT, modern monetary theory, instant money on demand, mouse click money could technically buy the entire stock and bond market, could buy the entire um, treasury market. Technically, we could always avoid a fall in markets, but to do that would require lots of mouse click money and creating lots of mouse click money inherently debases the value of that money and, and dilutes it. And so what you have then is inflation bordering on hyperinflation, which is wealth destruction, which is an invisible tax that becomes fatal. And we're just seeing the small pieces of that in the last couple of years, in the last year in particular. Remember, Powell said inflation was transitory, temporary. Bernanke said the QE1 would be temporary back in 2009. 
Nixon said that the gold standard, getting off the gold standard in 1971 would be temporary. That was over 50 years ago. So trust in what these experts have been saying to us from Nixon to Bernanke to Powell is deteriorating, not because folks like me are calling them out, but because everybody sees it. And so to your question, yeah, QE can theoretically keep markets from ever going down, but it's at a cost. It's at the cost of the currency. And um, that is, to me, un undeniable and irrevocable at this point. So Powell, I think, with the pressure from Janet Yellen and from the world markets and from the currency, will at some point, and don't ask me when because nobody knows, at some point something's going to break bigger than Silicon Valley Bank, something bigger than Credit Suisse, um, and something even bigger uh, than our biggest fears in the stock and bond markets. And that will force Powell to do what all central bankers have been doing since Greenspan, is bail out whatever that problem is with mouse click money. They can do it behind the scenes in the repo markets. They can do it in bailouts or bail-ins on the banks. They can do it what is effectively QE and not call it QE, but they're going to have to create fiat money uh, or and or do some global chapter 11 reset and blame it on COVID, blame it on Putin, blame it on global warming. I don't know. Blame it on whatever they want to blame it on. They'll never ever take responsibility when it's so simple. We have inflation because the broad money supply, the M2 money supply went up by 14 trillion because Fed balance sheets and central bank balance sheets around the world are inflated beyond anything reasonable. And because they've just been too addicted to their mouse click money, their whiskey, they're getting sick and they're passing that hangover on to investors, depositors, citizens all over the world. That's, that's what I see. Yeah, definitely. And if you think about it, it's all been, as you mentioned before, it's all been sort of kept going through this debt market that, you know, you say there's QE, but also lots of other com countries have been continuing to buy US debt rather than holding US dollars. Do you, do you see a risk that potentially, as you said, if they sort of go away from the US dollar, if they stop buying US debt, not only will uh, the US sort of struggle to raise debt, they'll have to probably buy it themselves, but all the US dollars will actually go back into the US from internationally. Do you see that as a major threat? Yeah, you're hitting really important and true points. Um, the treasury market and the US dollar, the two sacred, the most sacred bond in the world, the most important bond, the yield on the 10-year treasury or the Uncle Sam's IOU, it's the most important treasury. It's used as collateral for the derivative markets. It's used as reserve assets on every central bank in the world. So the treasury matters and the US dollar, that certainly matters. It's, um, it's still, like I said, 40% of all US debt, it's 60% of the value of all currencies in the world. It's an important dollar and an important bond. And those things don't die overnight. But what we are seeing uh, is a shift away from both slowly then all at once. The same things we talked about last time are just evolving. They're not changing. They're just coming further and further down the road. In terms of the U.S. Treasury, yes, <laughs> when you raise rates and other, company, and other countries, whether it's a banana republic somewhere in the third world or whether it's Japan, a so-called leading economy, when the U.S. raises rates and plays around with the treasury, well, then countries like Japan have to sell more treasuries to get more liquidity to boost their own markets. So it all has a ripple effect. So they have to dump treasuries. I think Powell and Larry Summers, and at one point Biden, if he was thinking at all, thought that if they raised rates, that would attract more interest in Uncle Sam's U.S. Treasury, Uncle Sam's IOU. It did the exact opposite, completely backfired. And I, I think they also thought that by making the dollar stronger, that would make more countries attracted to the dollar. That too has completely backfired because too many countries are tired of being bullied by a strong dollar and they can't afford to pay those dollar denominated debts back with higher and higher rates, which is why you're seeing this massive, massive effort by countries to do settlements, do oil purchases, do trades in either you know, bilateral agreements in rupees and reals and yuan and rubles and not dollars or not just bilateral, even aggregated agreements like in the BRICS or find some new way. But the, the, the clear and irrevocable and irreversible trend now is slowly but surely getting away from the dollar that they've been prisoner to um, for decades. And remember, you know, this important 
1944 when we had Bretton Woods, America came out of World War II. We just legitimately were the great generation that just saved Europe from Franco, Mussolini, Hitler. Um, you know, we stopped. It was a good war, so to speak. And we came out of that with a lot of debt. But the world looked to us to lead in manufacturing, to lead in credit. And we promised in 1944, when, when the world agreed to use the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency, that that dollar, that reserve currency, that powerful dollar was gold backed. That gave it more credibility. Within 30 years, Nixon welched on that by taking the gold off. So that world reserve currency was now no longer a good currency, but it was still a bully. It could still make countries in South America take out debt and countries in Africa or Asia take out debt that effectively made them a prisoner to the US dollar. And now with the sanctions in Russia in February of last year, it, it certainly upset the, the apple wagon in Russia, but other countries are saying, well, if America can freeze Russia's U.S. Treasury reserves, their reserve assets, they can do it to any of us. And now, not only did they not trust the dollar because it's no longer gold back post, post Bretton Woods because Nixon welched on the Bretton Woods magic, not only did they welch in 71, now they're, they're freezing Putin's assets, whatever you think of Putin, and their country's friendly and angry with the U.S. or enemies of the U.S., but all agreed that that was a weaponization of a fiat reserve currency. And that's why you're seeing, no surprise, that the BRICS are finding ways um, to, to get away from the dollar and slowly de-dollarize. And that has slow, steady, and then very serious ramifications. And again, I'm not saying that the yuan will be the world reserve currency. It certainly won't be Bitcoin either. What I am saying is the hegemony of the dollar is completely changed. The world reserve status won't change overnight. That'll take years because the yuan does, China doesn't have a viable bond market. It doesn't have a strong enough currency. There are enough reserve assets in yuan. But what we are seeing, not the end of the world reserve currency right away, but we're clearly seeing between last year and now that the hegemony, the respect, the trust, and the faith in the US dollar it, it has irrevocably changed. And that will have long-term ramifications and, and short-term ramifications. Uh, but that's undeniable now. Yeah, it's scary to think. And as you yeah. said, when uh, when Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia sort of go moving together, that's even more scary. You know, they've been fighting world proxy war for ten years. So if you're yeah. pushing these all, all these enemies towards each other just because they you're the common common enemy, that's mm -hmm. concerning moving forward. And think about who brokered that deal with China. I mean, excuse me, with uh, with Iran and Saudi Arabia. It was China who came in. Mm. Who's who's trying to create peace in the Ukraine? It wasn't Kamala Harris and, and Biden wasn't the neocons hidden between every back alley in DC looking ideologically for war to save this image of what America once was at the expense of Ukrainian and Russian soldiers. No, who is trying to create peace now? And I'm not a fan of Xi Jinping. I'm not, I don't want the world to look like China, but let's be honest, it's China that's now taking advantage of this vacuum of weakness in the US, whatever your partisan views, and I'm not here to talk politics, but Biden is not considered a strong leader, whatever your views. And so is it a coincidence that when Biden goes to Saudi Arabia and, and fist pumps the leader there, no one cares. When China shows up, he's broken a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. No one thought that was possible. When, when, when a whole generation of Ukrainian soldiers or men are disappearing right now in a war that could have been avoided, who's trying to broker a peace? It's not the US, it's China. And so it's fascinating. Not only is the dollar and the treasury losing respect, the reputation and intentions and motives of the US are losing respect. Many people are waking up and saying, is it any coincidence that when a country's broke and bankrupt that you start to see inflation and you start to see a devaluation of the currency and you see continued proxy wars? America is always in a proxy war. And again, I'm American. I grew up playing baseball. I love this country. I love it more than St. Petersburg or Beijing. But America is not what it used to be. And we haven't brought democracy, freedom, and an apple pie to Iraq, Syria, or Afghanistan. And now what are we doing in the Ukraine? So people are losing faith in our leadership, in our currency, and in our bonds. And that is not trying to be cynical. It's just open the newspaper. It's just look at the world. And even the newspaper in the fourth estate has done a terrible job of being objective about this. But people aren't naive anymore. They're seeing a decline in Western influence in general and certainly a decline in U.S. respect. And a lot of the reason people don't respect America or the U.S. or its leadership, it's like you don't respect a friend, a cousin, a brother, a sister, a parent who's always in debt, who's always pushing you around. You lose respect for them no matter how much you might have respected them before when they're bankrupt. 
their opinions mean less. And America is bankrupt morally in some ways, financially in other ways. Again, very debatable points, but the math all points to this. You can have, I'm very patriotic, but you have to be critical of your own country, whether you're in Australia or Canada or the US. You have to be honest about the math. You can have your own opinions about the politics, but you got to be critical. That's not being not patriotic. That's just being critical. And so to your, you know, to your question, America, its influence, its currency, its bonds, all of these things are falling simultaneously. And that's not a coincidence. Hemingway was right. When you start to go into debt and you're a bankrupt nation, you lose credibility, you buy some time. You get momentary prosperity is what he called it, and then permanent ruin. And it's always currency debasement, inflation, and war. And look at where we're at. And Hemingway wasn't a congressman, a senator, or a central banker. He was just a straight talker. Whether you like his books or not, that's where we're at. Yeah, it definitely seems like almost like the the child who cried wolf. They're sort of the US keep threatening. It's like the Saudi Arabia, you need to continue. You know, you need to uh, pump more oil or or China, you need to stop doing this and that. And then they're just sort of not listening to the threats now. It's like, oh, there's only so many times you can threaten me yeah. before I actually just stop believing what you, that you're going to do any of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's an interesting observation. And America, you know, has bullied financially and bullied militarily for so long. Uh, and what are the results? Again, objectively, what are the results? What did we bring to Iraq? Why were we in Iraq? Again, I'm a patriot. Most of my friends are are veterans. They'll say to me, we went there for weapons of mass destruction. They weren't there. We didn't bring democracy. I'm not pro Gaddafi. I'm not pro Libya. I'm not pro uh, Saddam Hussein. But, you know, Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi did two things wrong. One wanted to sell gold in euros and the other wanted to sell gold and, uh, excuse me, wanted to sell oil in euros and the other wanted to sell oil in gold. And look what happened to Gaddafi and look what happened to Saddam Hussein. We were there spreading democracy, but what we were really worried about in many other ways is that loss of the petrodollar. Countries like Libya and, and countries like Iraq thinking they'd have the audacity to sell oil outside of the U.S. dollar. In 2003, and in those years, America could bully Iraq and Libya, but they can't do that with Russia and China and the rest of the world forever. At least I hope they don't think they can because they're taking they're risking already too many lives in, in, the, in the Ukraine right now. Now, again, the genie can't go back in the bottle. Uh, the respect for our policies and for our doublespeak and for, our, uh, I'd say, hypocrisy about freedom and Operation Freedom or Wars of Freedom. Again, this is not to disparage anything about American men and women or other soldiers in other nations fighting for their nations. They're, they're lions. But I've said they're lions being led by donkeys. I would much rather see uh, and hang out with a Navy SEAL or a Marine than a politician. But what's unfortunate, these great men and women who are fighting in these wars are being led by politicians who have absolutely no regard for math or common sense or history. And and, and we have not paved a road that I think is very credible anymore. And certainly our, our fiscal policy, our monetary policy, and our global um, uh, influence has taken a huge, huge dent in the last 12 to 15 months. Absolutely irrevocable. Yeah, I agree. So, so if we take a step back and go back to the bond market, so we were mentioning there that uh, you know U.S. dollars and other sort of government treasuries are used quite a lot for collateral. If there were to be the case where, as you said, there's potential for a debt crisis, there's going to be hyperinflation in currencies, which is going to be uh, the, the thing that really uh, bears the brunt of the issues. What collateral could come in and actually continue the financial system? Is there anything? Yeah. That- yeah, there's this great because just get back from all this, you know, anger about American politics, bonds, IOUs, and foreign policy. Get right back to brass taxes. Let's get back to the bond market and, and particularly the fallout in the bond market post Silicon Valley Bank as a metaphor. Because remember, we had the repo crisis, we had the guilt crisis, we had the bond crisis 2020. When you look past the balance sheet and the stories and the headlines of failed regional banks, what was really interesting about the bond market. In the banking crisis of late, the banking crisis 2.0, the banking crisis 2023, was what happened after the bond market or the, excuse me, the banking crisis. And this doesn't make the headlines because it's boring, but I'll try and keep it interesting. Um, it's it's boring things like the euro dollar futures market or the yield on the two year treasury or the yield on the four week treasury or note or the volatility in the two year futures market. In each of those cases, just after Silicon Valley Bank, 
you saw three sigma moves, for example, in the futures market in the two year. Now there was a guy named David Ingalls at, at, at Bloomberg who said, I think that happens statistically once every 50 million years, three sigma moves. I won't get into the MIT math that's beyond me, but massive volatility in something as boring as the two year futures, the two year treasury futures market. No one looks at that. I don't blame them. Why would they? Or if they look at the, the 60 to 70 basis point costs in buying Euro dollar futures, that hasn't, we haven't seen that's twice it was at Lehman in, during the crisis in 2008 or the spreads in the treasuries. We haven't seen that since 9-11. So these were events that we haven't seen since 9-11, 2008, or 1987, or Lehman. And yet they didn't even make the headlines because they're they're hidden in this weird kind of treasury market spreads and no one looks at. But when you see the Euro dollar futures, again, no one has to know what that is. But I'll tell you briefly, when the Euro dollar, when the price of a contract on a Euro dollar future goes up, it's because there's a huge demand for it. And what is a Euro dollar future? It basically says the market thinks sometime in the near future, interest rates are going to come down. And why would interest rates come down? Because there's been an uh-oh moment somewhere in the U.S. markets. And so again, euro dollar futures, spreads, basis points, contract prices, strike prices, that's all really confusing. No one reads it. But let me make it real simple. It all comes down to this. The market, not what the Fed says, but what the market knows, the, the bond jocks and the, and the, and the flow of monies, are saying the market expects a real uh-oh moment because something's going to break. Powell's going to have to pivot. No one knows when. No one knows what the next needle to hit the next balloon will be. They just know there's so many needles pointing at this debt balloon. And the, and the bond market in the euro dollar future market is saying we're expecting a major rate cut, which means we're expecting a real emergency. And that's why Powell's been raising rates all these months because he needs something to lower when things go really wrong. They're expecting that. They're pricing in. So what I'm trying to say is the market is already pricing in, regardless of what Powell says or even believes. Maybe he really does believe he can be Paul Volcker and raise rates in the backdrop of 30 plus trillion in debt. Paul Volcker only had less than 900 billion. So Paul Volcker could raise rates. I don't know how Powell doesn't know this, but for some reason he thinks he can keep pushing until something breaks, but something's breaking every month. And so the market is saying, Expect lower rates because Powell's going to be forced to bring them down, and it'll only bring them down when there's real pain. And so the collateral is the bond market, to your point. And if no one else wants those bonds, or the spreads are getting higher, or the yields are going up because there's less and less natural demand, that's why yields and rates are going up. If no one else will buy those bonds, Powell will have no choice. Yellen won't give him the choice at the Treasury Department. She'll say, we've got to print more money. We need more instant liquidity because that is the collateral for everything. The entire story of the post-08 recovery is America is flying on rotten wings. And those rotten wings are debt. And the, and the debt is those IOUs, those U.S. Treasuries. And if no one buys them, we're going to have to buy them ourselves, which means we're going to have to monetize them, which means we're going to have to mouse click money to buy those treasuries. It's like, again, I've said, maybe it was with you or someone else, if I write a book and nobody buys it, but my dad writes a check for a million bucks and sends it to the publisher, I can go to the next party and say, I'm a best-selling author. Look at me, pour me a glass of wine. But I didn't sell those books. My dad bought them all. And if our bond market is saved, it's only because our Fed printed money to buy them, but no one trusts them. And if the Fed prints all that money to buy them, he's ruining the currency. There is no good scenarios left. It's either massive inflation or massive uh, depression in the economy. And I guarantee you, well, I don't, no one should guarantee anything, but I'm saying what will happen, in my opinion, that could always happen throughout history, is when, 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 the, when the government and when the Fed and when the Treasury has a choice between a tanking bond market and a tanking economy and a tanking stock market or a devalued currency, they're going to choose the devalued currency. They're going to print more money. It's the only thing they have. They don't have it in GDP and they don't have it in tax receipts. So where are they going to get this money? It's not coming from Santa Claus. It's going to come from their magical money maker at the Eccles building. And sadly, that's going to be similar in, in other countries too, which have the same kind of you know, pattern, the same kind of policy. It's going to happen. It's already happening in Japan. It's been happening for years. It's going to happen in Australia. It's going to happen at the ECB. And it'll happen at the Bank of England. And, and every time they try to push rates up, the markets can't sustain it. The markets can't handle it. They need more magical fake money to keep these bond markets from going completely underwater. And that is inflationary. You can have disinflationary forces like markets going down, 
but inflation is about the money supply and the money supply is what keeps the bond markets alive and that money supply is about to expand and I do not know when, I do not know what will be the next event, but already the bailouts for the regional bank just took all the money we tightened last year and put it right back in. It's just another form of liquidity. It wasn't QE, but it's QE. It's basically QE. You know? Yes. Yeah, so what, what does that mean, I guess, for our financial system and for our economy if, as you said, what happens occurs, currencies you know, devalue a lot, um, you know, I guess you can say de-financialization around the world. What would that look like? And I guess mm-hmm. who would be the winners, who would be the losers? Would it be the countries that are, uh, you know, mm-hmm. have those commodities or who else, who would it be? Well, Australia's, you know, I was talking to Brian Payne and, and Daryl and there's like, we make all these great commodities, but we give them away, keep them, right? The countries that are rich in natural resources that know how to manage them are going to be successful. Uh, our, our advisor and colleague, good friend, Ronnie Sturfla, who wrote the In Gold We Trust report, he wasn't just talking about gold. He created a graph a few weeks ago. He tweeted out, it was a brilliant graph. He says, it's the most important graph of the decade. And all it was was commodity cycles, right? Markets, S&P, Dow, NASDAQ, stock markets, when they're peaking, commodities are way down here. And as soon as those markets start to tank because of deflationary forces like bonds collapsing, stock buybacks are no longer viable, Debt rollers are more like viable. Markets start to puke. Well, then there's this commodity cycle, and again, it's 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 math, it's history, it's cycles. Um, as as currencies get devalued to support unloved, untrusted, unwanted bonds, real assets get their get their moment in the sun, and that moment can last for a long time. And I think we're on the verge, and I think Ronnie's correct. It's probably the most important chart of the decade. We're on the verge of a commodity super cycle. That's not me talking in my book just because precious metals are one of those commodities. Real assets as a general class or other commodities as a general class are going to be far more important than worthless paper bonds and worthless fiat currencies and worthless digital currencies, which are still backed by nothing. So to your question, again, it doesn't mean it's a straight line. It doesn't mean there isn't need to manage risk, but the direction away from fiat money in, 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 in absolutely bubbled stock and bond and real estate markets, the new direction is going to be towards real assets. And uh, the long game for investors, as opposed to speculators, the long game will be commodities in general. And of course, when currencies die, silver and gold and monetary metals do well. It's, it's again, it's not a gold bug apology. It's, it's something we've been watching and patiently waiting for years. Not that gold gets stronger. Currencies just get weaker. There's no way to make currencies stronger when they're backed by nothing but hot air. And as I said all of last year, the U.S. dollar, its rise, it's 112 on the DXY, all those numbers, those were, those were legitimately temporary because the markets can't, can't sustain long rates that long. Even the US markets can't, US dollar can't. So even the US dollar, which was relatively stronger than all these other currencies is now repricing vis-a-vis gold because the US dollar is getting weaker. There is no magical currency left. They're all fiat currencies throughout the world. And those countries that have more natural resources and more gold, and there's a reason why gold flows, physical gold flows are going from west to east. China and Russia, again, I'm not pro-China, not pro-Russia, don't want to see that communism or totalitarianism be the new thing. Although you could say in Canada and Australia and America during COVID, it was pretty totalitarian. But I would say these countries like Russia and China and India have suffered for generations. They know how to suffer and they're patient and leaders, whether you like them or not, like Putin, are patient. And now these countries are quietly quietly and calmly and secretly acquiring more and more physical gold. The, the World Gold Council's notion of what China has in physical gold is a complete fiction. We all know that they have much, much more tonnage than is reported. Why? Because when things really start to fall apart, China is going to reemerge with something that's more trusted. In other words, something more gold covered. And if the IMF or the World Bank or the US Fed or the new reset or the new central bank digital currencies around the world want to have any credibility, they're going to have to have some gold coverage. So he who has the most gold at the end, when things start to fall apart, will have more credibility because more and more people are waking up to the fact that fiat currencies are no longer as credible as they were uh, 10 years ago, 10 months ago, and certainly 50 years ago. Since since we welched on Bretton Woods in 71, it's just been a very slow process. Now it's happening all at once. Yes, yeah, so I guess if you look at the winners versus losers, you, you mentioned Australia, probably the, the high commodity producers, you know, Russia, mm-hmm. um, Brazil, yeah. they're probably going to be okay. And then the other countries, so, you know, Japan, China, Europe, um, they're probably going to have to try and accumulate as much as they can before 
this this crisis occurs you know north america would probably be okay they're quite a large commodity producer as well is that sure, sort of what I mean, you're saying sure i mean again this is the big the big thing why are we talking so much about global warming and the debate i'm not here to win or, or finish that debate but why are we worried about saudi arabia selling gold or selling oil and another currency when we have our own oil right in the u.s and you have countries like venezuela and latin america they're natural resource rich but they're so corruptly run the governments are so corruptly run that they can't they can't exploit and 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 really intelligently um, manage their own natural resources. And the question is, will Australia manage its natural resources? Probably better than Venezuela did, right? But Venezuela had other reasons, but it's a, it's a mix of cultural, political, and then bullying from the US and who owned what and who was crafting what. If you're in a totalitarian country like China, they can manage it. You may not wanna live there, but when it comes to managing those resources, they're gonna be able to do it quite well because they'll do it based on reality, not based on politics. So yes, absolutely the winners with the most natural resources will win. The, those with the most gold will win, whether they produce it themselves or whether they've collected it themselves. But keep in mind that most of the gold is refined in Switzerland, but it comes from Eurasia. It comes from places like Russia and Asia. So they have a vested interest in seeing gold uh, reemerge as something that gives credibility to currencies. And we already saw the Moscow World Standard last year as a new LBMA exchange, a new way to fairly price gold outside of the LBMA banks and the OTC markets and the futures contracts that have manipulated legally price fixed gold, paper price, uh, price of uh, paper, fix the paper price of gold for decades. Um, so, yeah, there's all kinds of seismic shifts happening. And again, I'm not saying it's the end of the world, I'm not even saying it's the end of the dollar or the end of America or the end of heroes in America and great leaders, military, financial, political. There's just less and less of them. And there's going to be less and less influence because so many years of living beyond our means and paying for that with money clicked out of nowhere, out of thin air. Uh, is finally seeing cracks in the ice wherever you look. And now we're seeing literally every month a new headline. I don't know what it'll be next. Egon was talking about a banking crisis in January and February this year, because it's just one more symptom of when you when you raise rates and you and you distort the bond markets. Uh, you know, David Stockman was writing about this six years ago. Um, so it's it's it, the, the idea of psychically timing them is 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 disingenuous. But the math and history and reality of preparing for them is incredibly simple. It's just the inevitable consequences of really bad management of monetary policy for really since 2008 in particular, but since, you know, probably 1997, 98 specifically, just this idea that you can print your way out of a problem. A 10 year old would know that doesn't last forever. It's a counterfeit solution to a counterfeit currency by counterfeit professionals. And the fact that Ben Bernanke got a Nobel Prize for this idea defies, defies all reason. But again, when the math is bad, you need to promulgate and prop up new heroes, even if they're false idols, to give credibility. Ben Bernanke must have been a genius. No, he wasn't. Anyone was a genius at the party, whips out a credit card and buys everyone a free meal. He's a genius. Look at the prosperity. What, he, what you don't see is who's gonna pay that credit card? Who's gonna pay it when he leaves the room? And that's what we've been living on, credit cards and whiskey for over a generation now. And now it's starting to crack. Uh, I think it's very obvious. Banks, markets, bonds, treasuries, spreads, futures contracts. And you're also seeing you know, precious metals and, and certainly gold and silver getting repriced. And there'll still be volatility. There'll still be volatility, but the direction is up into the, up into the right. Yep. So I guess if we look, if we take a step down to the individual investor, you'd say the same things that, as you were saying before, stock markets and all those financial assets are probably going to go down in this in the cycle, and then during the commodity super cycle, they're going to go up. So you'd say for them, it's looking at those commodities could be an option. Yeah, and we talked about this last year, but again, and and, and I don't always get it right. But look, you don't. You're a weatherman. You see clouds. Is it going to rain at three thirty or three forty five or five twenty? But what we said last year was true. It was going to be brutal on risk assets and in, in, in risk parity portfolios, stock and bond portfolios, which is the bread and butter of the RIA industry. It's the bread and butter of consensus think advisors who can huddle together in a bull market and take credit for a, a QE driven bull market. But when, it is a, when things go wrong, they always blame it on some extraneous event because they really weren't hedging. They weren't really protecting against risk. They were riding a trend. And as I said last year, Stock bond portfolios are the worst portfolios you could be in because they're correlated. They don't protect each other. They go up and down together now based on years of distorted monetary policy. And last year, we had the worst nominal returns in stocks and bonds in the U.S. since 1871. When 
when you saw, you know, stocks like the S&P down 50, NASDAQ tech stocks down 30 percent, and, and, and then the, the entire swath of the bond market from high yield to investment grade credits taking huge hits last year. So where did you hide? Where could you hide? It wasn't just a phenomenon of 2022 because of Powell's rate hikes. It's a slow slow devolution of these risk assets that have been bubbles really since 2008 and the bond market's been a bubble since 1980 but all this artificial support of these credit markets which had a direct impact on equity markets is is losing its its punch and so those assets to your question risk parity portfolio stocks and bonds are no longer safe they're bubble assets so where do you hide you can't put everything in gold and silver or platinum or palladium you can't put everything in commodities but you have to have i think a hard conversation with your advisors about what they're doing to hedge risk if they just say well we've got you in short-term treasuries or short-term bonds okay great but is that what else what else are we doing inverse ETFs? So are we trying to short a sector that's clearly dying? Are we just in more different, diverse types of equities which are gonna go down together, good, bad, and the ugly, and the same thing with bonds. So it's really having honest, critical conversations with advisors and tell them, you know, call BS when they're just giving you the same party line about, well, just bite a stick, this is just a downturn, it'll come back up. Well, that's what the Chinese, that's what the Japanese thought in 89 when the Nikkei crashed. They haven't recovered their highs, and that was 30 plus years ago. What's different now is if we have another major dip or correction, the only way to save that will be massive amounts of you know synthetic money, synthetic demand, quantitative easing. So then fine, if they recover the bond and stock markets by printing trillions more, well, well then, okay, the markets are back up 20%, but real inflation will be higher than that. So you're running uphill in roller skates at that point. So you need to have assets that can't be printed or mouse clicked. You need to have assets with real value as a, mar a, a major part of your portfolio. Um, and, and that's just, again, common sense. There is a reason uh, for commodity exposure. I remember years when I was in a family office, commodity markets go up 30%, 20%, up and down. They were very volatile. And they were too volatile. And that was the time when the Fed, though, was, was actively managing the stock market like a portfolio manager. But now, as that QE is losing its its power and all it does is create more inflation, it's a perfect red, you know, green light and red light saying stop at the, at the risk assets and a green light saying go towards commodity exposure, real assets. Um, it's just common sense. It doesn't mean concentration risk, doesn't mean your whole portfolio, but it has to be truly diversified and not diversified with your standard diversified bonds and your diversified stocks. That's a real trap right now, I think. And just going hog wild into commodities can be very dangerous too. You have to really think about these things. And most people don't know how to trade short and they shouldn't. It's very risky. Short squeezes are everywhere, but you can use intelligent uses of inverse ETFs. You have to be actively managed. You've got to be thinking about commodities in general and at least some exposure to precious metals. And in our opinion, of course, at Matterhorn, physical, physical metals, not ETF metals and certainly not metals that are quote unquote owned at a bank near you, which most of the time is just hypothecated out and not available for delivery when you need it. So there's a lot for investors to be thinking about right now. Yeah, definitely. And I guess if we look at commodities over the past 20 years, there's been sort of a correlation, almost a co-movement with the general market. So it'll be interesting to see if we see that sort of decoupling between correlation of commodities with the market in the coming years during this event. Yeah, I'll send you the link to Ronnie's uh, graph of the decade on the commodity cycles. And it's again, it's 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 not talking a book. It's just data. And, you know, graphs can be uh, misleading and, and, and they can be uh, helpful and they can be confusing. But it's it's very simple when currencies are dying and inflation is rising and the inherent purchasing power of your money is getting weaker and risk asset bubbles, and no one can deny that bonds and stocks were bubbles, whatever you think, if you're a bull or a bear, they're clearly overvalued uh, by every metric. And they have been for years because they've been supported. So even if you're a bull, that's fine. You can disagree. But you know, when you have uh, discredited fiat currencies and you have risk assets that are nearing tops, clearly they're not at the top and they're not at the bottom by any means. But commodities have a role to play there. You just, that's just, again, whether I was pushing bonds for Goldman Sachs or selling gold in Switzerland, you have to admit that. And for us, we're patient. You know, Rick Rule, I keep repeating him. He said it better than anyone I've ever heard. He was talking about silver, but he was, you know, it's true for gold. He said precious metals, and he was talking about silver, reward infrequently, but extravagantly. And for investors who are thinking longer term and trying to buy insurance against banking risk and currency risk, 
gold is 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 doing just fine. It's doing its job. It's just sitting there staring back at you from a hole in the ground that you pay a fee for. It's not sexy. It's not spinning around like all these tech stocks and Binance stocks and FTXs and, and crypto exchanges. It's not nearly the same sexy story, but it gets the last laugh because it goes up as currencies go down and currencies that are spinning around and sexy are losing value as we're speaking. So you know, it's just common sense. It's not huge, get rich quick, but the way to make money, and I learned this the hard way, is not to lose money. You've got to preserve your wealth. And if you're a trader or you're, you know, a high frequency trader or you're all about trading, fine. Do your longs and shorts, buy your options, buy your puts and calls, lever them however you want. If you're an investor, that's a totally different mindset. You've got to have some real assets in your portfolio. It's just common sense. It's long-term thinking, it's wealth preservation. Yeah, it's very important. So Matthew, thanks again for your time today. I really appreciate it. So uh, always, always a pleasure. Yeah, always we'll have pleasure. to do it again soon. Uh, my my yeah. last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation? I think be critical. Be critical of you and me. Be critical of your advisor. Be critical of your headlines. Be critical of gold. Be critical of Bitcoin. Be critical of stocks and bonds, but be informed. You know, Listen to as many people as you can. What's great about all these different platforms is at least people are speaking their honest opinions. Uh, it's unconstrained, but I think people do need to be more critical and don't just take one pundit advisor or, or um, hedge fund manager's word for it, but get informed, read some books, read some common sense. But ultimately, as we all have it, we all have common sense, rely on your common sense. If I add a bucket of water to a glass of wine, that wine's going to lose its flavor. And we've been adding buckets of QE to our currencies and they're going to lose their power. And what can you do? doesn't always have to be gold and silver, but what can you do knowing that? How do you measure your wealth? And uh, that's my, I'll leave people with that thought. Be critical. Don't, don't abandon your own judgment, but make sure that judgment is informed by as many different voices and opinions as you can, as you can believe. Yeah. Great message. Yeah. It's always listening to different opinions that you might not agree yeah. with to try and see yeah. if there's anything that, as yeah. you said, that common sense, uh, comes out on top, but yeah, but yeah. thanks again. So if anyone wanted to find out more about your work, is there any place that they can, find that yep. uh yeah goldswitzerland.com matterhorn asset management we're based out of zurich but egon and i and ronnie surf a lot of times too throwing we have articles every week which talk about all these risks uh very strong opinions but there are opinions and uh um and again we challenge you to to challenge us but i think you'll find that we're we're, we're just speaking blunt math basic history and cycles um and hopefully hopefully that'll resonate with people yep definitely I'll pull out in the description later but thanks again all right thank you anthony Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.